Hey Grace Bible Church, great to see you today. We are in the last week of our series, Self-Care While Self-Quarantined. And before we get going today, I want to invite you to grab something to write with, really to doodle with. Grab a pen, a paper. Uh, Kids, grab your crayons or markers. Grab a sketch pad because I'm going to show you a diagram today that if you are a doodler, if you're someone who likes to write things down, I think you'll enjoy this and it'll help you to remember it. So Whether you want to hit pause and then come back or you just want to grab something, I would encourage you to do that uh, and we'll get to it in just a minute. But in this last week of self-care while self-quarantined, I want to talk about the person that is driving all of us crazy. I mean, don't lie to me. Come on. There is somebody in your life and they are driving you crazy. They're they're the person that you can't ever figure out why they're doing what they're doing. They're they're, they're that person that you think to yourself, "Why, why would you do that again? Or why wouldn't you make a better choice? And we all have this person in our life. And I want to tell you who this person is. This person is you. You're the person. I'm the person. When I think of self-care while self-quarantined and I think about the person that I struggle with the most, it is me. And the the good news today is that this is not unique to COVID-19. There is nothing in this season of our world, in this season of life that is really unique. We all wrestle with ourselves the most. And so today I want to help us think through how we can better make sense of our lives. Because because there is one thing about you and there's one thing about me that if we get this one thing in right perspective, it will help us to better understand what is going on around us and what is going on inside of us. And here's the question I would like to let frame our time together today. Here's the question. What story do you tell yourself about the world? What story do you tell yourself about the world? See, we are all telling ourselves a story about how the world works and about how we fit into the world. We just can't, <clears throat> we just can't help it. And, and the story we tell ourselves will frame how we think about everything else in life. So, so for instance, if your story is some version of, I just can't get a break. If it's going to go wrong, it goes wrong. Nothing ever seems to go my way. If that's the story that you tell yourselves, that, yourself, that will set the direction of your life. Or, or maybe your story is more like this. Maybe your story is, nobody loves me. I'm, I'm rejected. I'm uncared for. I'm unloved. If that's the story you're telling yourself, then that will set your trajectory. Or may, maybe your story is more like this. Maybe your story is more, I'm fine. I don't know what's wrong with all these jokers around me. Now, you could have one of those stories or one of a thousand stories, but today I want to help us. I want to help us to find ourselves in the bigger story that God is telling about the world. I want to help you find your story in the midst of his bigger story. And to help you do this, I want to tell you a story or the story inspired by this little booklet right here. This little booklet, True Story, A Christianity Worth Believing In. You can find this on Amazon. You can Google it. James Chung is the author there. It's a phenomenal little page pamphlet that unpacks the bigger story of the Bible, the bigger story of you and the bigger story of me. Now, there are a couple reasons that I want to tell you this story today. One, one is, one is that in the midst of pain, and we are all experiencing pain corporately, that's the unique thing about this time in the history of our world, not pain, but that we're all experiencing a similar pain together. In the midst of pain, we look for a way to make sense of life. And as you are experiencing disappointment and grief and loss, you need a way to make sense of the world, a way to make sense of how your story fits into the bigger story. And I think this little booklet can help. 
The other reason I would like to share this with you today is that actually I shared this idea just a few months ago, January 12th, but it wasn't my favorite sermon ever, and I want to tell you why. What, what you probably don't know is that on January 11th, on Saturday, I took my wife to the emergency room. I took her to the emergency room in the afternoon because she was having some pain in her abdomen and I took her around 4 or 4.30 and I thought to myself, well, if we get in at 4 or 4.30, then they'll probably get us out by 10, 11 and we'll be good to go for Sunday. Well, about 11 o'clock, we discovered that the issue was that her ovary had ruptured and they were going to do emergency surgery. <laughs> and now we had this question, okay, what do we do about Sunday? Do, do I preach? Do I not preach? And as we talked about it, she said, hey, how about this? How about if they do the surgery and every everything goes great, then you go ahead and preach. If not, if there is any issue, if there's any tension, then, then you just call Ryan in the morning and Ryan can preach. Now, fortunately for Ryan, uh, they took Ashley into surgery. And when she, when she came out, she was like a new woman. I mean, she felt so much better. So I spent the night with her in the hospital, got up the next morning, went and took a shower, came to church, preached this message. But you know, when you spend the night in the hospital, in hindsight, it's just not the best preaching. So so what I want to do is do a quick retelling of this story and help us to walk in it together and then, and then apply it to our lives today. So the story you find yourself in, the story I find myself in goes like this. This is going to set up the story, okay? So there's going to be four circles. These are the first two. I wanted you to see where the first two go, and then we'll go through them together. But I wanted you, people who were drawn at home, first two circles, we're going to actually start over here. Let's talk about that circle together, the, the big, bigger circle. This represents the fact that in life, we all have an ache inside of us for things to be better than they are. There is something in you and there is something in me that says we are created for more. That's what these squiggly lines represent. And C.S. Lewis, the great theologian and author of the last century, C.S. Lewis once said that if we long for things to be different than they are. If we long for another world, it is likely that we were created for a different world. And so the, the fact that we thirst points to water. The fact that we hunger points to food. The fact that we long for intimacy and relationship and health and life points to the fact that we were created for something more than we are experienced, experiencing. And in this diagram, the first circle is this, that we were designed for good, that we are designed for good. Top left corner, designed for good. That you and I were actually designed for more than we were experiencing. We, we were not designed to shelter in place. We were designed for community. We were not designed for pain and loss and death. We were designed for life. We were designed for good. Now, in the grand story of the world, as it is revealed to us in the scriptures, and this is, this is so important, I want you to understand that the, the biblical story, the biblical worldview, we could call it, points to the fact that we were designed for good. And in Genesis chapter one, we read this simple idea. God saw all that he had made and it was very good. It was very good. You were designed for good. But we don't all experience this goodness. We could go back to the slides. We were designed for good, but we recognize that we are damaged by evil. That's the second picture, that we are damaged by evil. And we experience brokenness in our lives. We experience broken relationships with one another. Those have been fractured. We experience broken relationship with our planet, with creation. We're not living in harmony together. We experience broken relationships with our heavenly father. We all tend to live for ourselves. We all tend to put our own needs and our own wants first. I mean, heck, is there a better example of this than the toilet paper shortage, right? There's no toilet paper in the shelves, but I have so much toilet paper in my garage. I am a part of the problem. And in the New Testament, the Apostle Paul, when reflecting on what has happened in our world, said this. The Apostle Paul said this. He said, for the wages of sin is death. 
The wages of sin is death. See, when I choose to live for myself, when you choose to live for yourself, it's not just affecting you and your family and the people closest to you, but there is a ripple effect throughout all of planet earth, throughout all of creation, that we have been damaged by evil. And the challenges, the challenges, that as much as we long for evil to be done away with, as much as we long for God to break in and set all things right, and one day he will, we'll get to that in just a minute. The challenge is that if God were to just get away with, get, be done with evil, he would have to be done with me. And he would have to be done with you. If God did what we want him to do and we cry out for justice and we cry out for God to intervene, it would mean that God would be done with us. But here's the good news of the story of the gospel. Here's the good news of looking at your story in light of God's bigger story. When God looked at all that was wrong with planet earth, though, it was, though we were designed for good and he saw that we were damaged by evil, he didn't start over. No, he didn't start over. Instead, he intervened. And the third circle is that we are restored for better restored for better. Let's look at that a little more closely, a little more large there. Restored for better. Jesus came and God broke into our world. He broke into our lives and the cross represents the fact that God wanted to be with us. That when Jesus came, he came to bring restoration. He came to bring healing and life. That though your life is not what you want it to be, God looks at the brokenness in your life, the brokenness in mine, the brokenness in the world, and he demonstrates that he cares because Jesus entered our world. And the cross represents that Jesus came to bring life. It's actually the second half of the verse that we looked at just a minute ago. Romans 6, 23 says this, for the wages of sin is death, we know that, but the free gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus, our Lord. He offers us a gift of life, the gift of life. Now this is so important because if we can recognize that we are all a part of a story that began in a garden, that began with intimacy and community and life. And that we are all a part of a story that has been damaged by evil. Then we can recognize that when Jesus Christ entered the world, he came to begin life and to offer us life into the future. And we can see that here on earth, the goal is not to escape. The goal is not to escape the pain and the brokenness and the difficulty of life. The goal is to join with God in what he is already doing in the planet. That's the fourth picture. The fourth picture is this, that we are sent together to heal. Let's look at this a little more closely. We notice as we are sent together for he- to heal that Jesus is at the center that Jesus is at the center, we notice that we are in community and that in community, we are moving out into our broken world. And the call of followers of Jesus is not to huddle back, is not to huddle back and say, oh, I hope everything will be okay. But instead we are sent on mission with God. In fact, it's so clear in the New Testament that God calls his followers his ambassadors, his representatives in the world. The apostle Paul said it like this in 2 Corinthians chapter five. He says, we are therefore Christ's ambassadors as though God were making his appeal through us. What's an ambassador? An ambassador is a person who represents another. And as the kingdom of God is coming into the world, we are his ambassadors, his representatives. And our call is to be a part of bringing the healing power of God to the world. Well, look at that. Look at that diagram again. In little communities, we are his ambassadors moving into the brokenness of the world. And this is the story that we have to find ourselves 
in. Now, once we understand that this is the story we find ourselves in, we can begin to ask ourselves some other questions. You know, one, one question you might ask is, well, why, why do I need the resources of Jesus at all? Why, why can't everyone make a difference? Well, everyone can make a difference, but here's why we need Jesus. Let me show you the diagram again. As we recognize the fact that we are damaged by evil, there is a barrier between where we are and where we want to be. And the resources that we have because we are damaged by evil are so limited. And there's a barrier to get to accomplish all that God has for us. So we need the life-giving power of Jesus. We need the life-giving power of Jesus to move us to be sent together for, to heal. And here's why. One reason is that if I'm going to be a part of what God is doing in the world, I need Jesus to work in me. I have to recognize, and I would encourage you to recognize, that we are all damaged by evil and we need Jesus to do something in us even as he is sending us. And then, let me tell you, what Jesus is sending you to do is not something that you can do apart from him. This mission cannot be accomplished apart from Jesus. And this bigger story helps us to understand that in the beginning, it was good. Of course you long for it to be good, and I do, because we were designed for good. But we have all been damaged by evil. I'm telling you, it's one of the reasons following Jesus and being a Christian makes so much sense because the Christian worldview, the story of the scriptures, explains where we find ourselves. And we all live in a world that has been damaged by evil. And so Jesus came and he came to restore us and to send us. And this is why in the midst of COVID-19 and in the midst of all of the difficulties of life, we can have hope for the 757. That's what we've come up with. Hope for the 757 that we are not without hope because we believe that Jesus has come and Jesus is sending us hope. Now we define this hope for the 757 in these four big ways. We said that God is, that our ultimate hope is that God is, that that big story, that's God's story. You don't have to make that up. There's no pressure on you. He invites you into his story. And as you know that God is, in the midst of that story, you will see the goodness and the kindness and the grace and the patience and the justice of God. And the more that you and I find ourselves in the midst of God's bigger story of the world, the more we will know who God is. And I'm telling you, nothing gives me hope more than remembering who God is. We also said that God is with you. God is with you that he didn't stay far away, that Jesus came to be with us. Jesus, Emmanuel, God with us. New in the history of the world is the fact that God loves you so much that he didn't want to be apart from you. But he, he's with you in the good times, of course. Oh, but in the most difficult times, that even when you're damaged by evil, you are never alone. And that gives us hope. God is with you. He isn't just with you. He is for you. God is for you. It's good to remember that he loves you, that he likes you, that he's leaning in towards you. And the way we remember this, the way we make sense of our story, I'm telling you, the way you can make sense of your story is to not lose sight of what Jesus did. To not lose sight of what Jesus did. Look at the, how the Apostle Paul says it in Romans chapter 5 verse 8. God demonstrated his own love for us in this. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Not while we were good. While we were damaged by evil. While we were damaging others. Through the evil that lives in us. Christ died for us. He loves you. He is for 
you. And as difficult as your story might be, I just want you to know today that when you were at your worst, he loved you most. And when I remember that, I find hope. But that's not the end of it, right? We said the fourth thing, we said this a few weeks ago, is that God is sending you. God is sending you. We, we see this in our story that God is sending us. We see us in the story, in, in, in the grand diagram, that, that in the fourth picture here, right? Designed for good, damaged by evil. Jesus comes and now Jesus is sending us, sent together to heal. And this is the mission we are on in the world. Now, another sermon, another time, I'll, I'll, I'll give you just a hint that we are sent together for heal. We are establishing the kingdom of God here on earth. But one day, Jesus will return. And when Jesus returns, all the squiggles will be done and we'll be back up here. And we'll be done with all of this. But for now, we are sent together to make a difference in the world. But I, I want to I I just take this maybe a little bit different direction than you expected me to take it. What does it mean to be sent together for he to heal? Well, it, it means that we are to be the ambassadors. We are to be the messengers of hope. That, that part of having hope for the 757 is practically meeting the needs of the 757. That God is sending us to be people of hope. And so we've made masks and given blood and provided meals and, and driven people to, to do their, their errands. And all of those things are wonderful ways of providing hope. And we, we've shared good news of Jesus and love and forgiveness and acceptance and new life. But what about, what about like the rest of life? What, what does this story have to do with like going to work on Monday morning? And that's where I want to I want to land. I want to help you see that when you see your life in light of God's bigger story, it's not just about your church life or your spiritual life. It's about your life life. So I want I want to apply this diagram to a couple different people. What does it mean to find yourself in this story if you're in construction? You build stuff. You fix stuff. What is this, how does this help you understand what you're doing in your construction business? Let, let me help you see how you can find yourself here. The reason that construction is so important is that when we were designed for good, we had a pleasant place to live. We had beautiful, beautiful surroundings. And there is something in all of us that longs to live in a beautiful place. And if you're part of the construction industry, you are helping you are helping to create beautiful places for people to live. See, but we've all been damaged by evil. Things break. They wear down. They're destroyed by nature. And so in your construction business, as you are building beautiful things, as you are offering uh, work done with integrity and at a fair price, you are fighting against the evil in the world. Because evil wants people to have not beautiful places to live, not places that they can be proud of. And I'm not talking about opulence. I'm not talking about that we all get the biggest or the best, but I'm talking about something, something that protects and provides. And if you're in construction, you are fighting against this evil and pushing this way. And as you are doing this in Jesus' name, Jesus is calling you to do your best work. To not cut corners, to work with integrity, to be generous with your skills, to be generous with the money you make. And as you do that in your business, he is sending you together to heal. That it really matters what you do Monday through Friday and that you will run your business differently if you recognize that you are trying to solve a problem that the world has been damaged and we don't live in a garden paradise anymore. And so we need people with skills to help us to repair and to build. And when those people are filled with the power of Jesus and you show up not to make your name great, but to serve when you're sent together, when you're sent together to bring healing and life to people, you can recognize that that when you go to work and you go to the job site, you are on a mission from God. It, it, let's just say you're in the Navy. 
Say, say you're, you're in the Navy, right? Well, what does the Navy have to do with designed for good? Well, when we were designed for good, the world was full of justice. And at its best, our armed forces, our, our Navy exists to help bring justice because there is evil in the world. The world has been damaged by evil. And when you are a messenger of justice, when you are a vehicle of justice to liberate the oppressed and to care for those who no one else cares about, you are doing God's work. But when you do your naval service, having been restored for better, there is something happening inside of you that causes you, that causes you to see every duty station as God's assignment for you. I'm sure many of you who, who serve in the military have received orders that you would have rather not received. I want to encourage you, God is sovereign over every place you have been sent. And as he sends you, as you are being restored for better, he is sending you to be an agent of healing. And we need enlisted and officers who recognize that they are there not for themselves, but to serve others. Who recognize they are there not to make their name great, but to elevate the people around them, to create community, to bring justice to the world. It matters what you do really, really matters. And how you do it really, really matters. Life is going to be hard. Some days more than others. You're going to feel the weight of the fact that we have all been damaged by evil. But if you can find yourself in the bigger story, If you can find yourself in the bigger story and recognize that the way you have been damaged by evil is not unique and that it's not the end, that though damaged, Jesus has come to bring restoration and not only restoration, but that he wants to send you to be an agent of healing in the world. If you can see your life in this bigger story, you can begin to make sense of the world around you. And so today, I want to invite you to discuss this with whomever you might be watching this message with. And I want to give you three discussion discussion questions that you can talk about together. And the three questions are here. You can take a picture. You can write them down. You can hit pause. But which part of this story do you have the hardest time remembering and why? Which part of this story do you have the hardest time remembering? Is it just hard for you to remember that you were designed for good because you've been so beat down? Is it hard for you to believe that Jesus would live and die and rise again for you because you've been so bad? Which part and why? Secondly, what can you do to remind yourself and others of God's story? What can you do to remind yourself and others of God's story? And then thirdly, how are you being sent together to heal? Even in the midst of this time, as we're sheltering at home, unique season in the life of our world, we are still called to bring healing to the world. You need to go to gracebible.church, click on me to need. There are a variety of ways that we can be sent together, but probably the best ways are the ones that God is going to inspire you. So how are you being sent together to heal? He has not left you. You are not on your own. Your story is not beyond redemption. So as we are feeling the weight of the damage in our world, the way the evil has infected our bodies and our creation and our relationships, let's remember that that's not the end of the story. And let's find hope for ourselves and hope for the 757 that in the midst of all of this, God's not finished. There is hope. Let me pray for us. Heavenly Father, we come to you in Jesus' name and in the name of Jesus, I pray that we would find hope for ourselves and for our community and for our world in the fact that Jesus has come to bring restoration and redemption and that out of that redemption, we would feel ourselves compelled to be Christ's ambassadors in the world. Would you show each of us what it means to find ourselves in your story? We pray that you would do all of this in Jesus' name. Amen.